We're live. Calling Chris Anderson in London. Calling Rick Byer in Chicago. This nice, is London. nice to see you, London. Well. How are you? I'm doing okay. How Excellent. You? Excellent. You're moving to show us more books there, I see. Yeah, I don't want like half screen thing here. Uh, I want to just welcome everybody to History Happy Hour uh, here in the Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours Facebook and YouTube pages live from Chicago and London, London, wherever you are. And hi to Jack Sadler and hi to Doreen, who says that Chris is on a different side this week. I, he's just changing it up, Doreen. Chris is always on the other side, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> so it's uh, they're all different. Hello, Ted and Anne. And uh, we're just going to wait a moment or two before we get started. Um, and um, yeah. who else we have? Ken, hello. Ooh. How are you? Yeah, definitely give us a hello to say that you're here. And you can use this comment area to pose any questions you have during our broadcast. So, uh, Chris, I guess I think we have enough people. You know, 40 is the my minimum. So right. we have enough people to play the now – World famous legendary epic HHH Open. All right, so History Happy Hour, we're going to ring the bar open. <laughs> New prop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been here for the last three weeks. Where have you been? I don't know. Sorry. Come on, hello. Hello, hello London. Uh, technical difficulties last week. We're not having that this week because we have better drinks. There we go. We do. What have you got? I have a very nice uh, 14-year-old single malt. Uh, so what? which one? Uh, it is. Hard bag? Hard bag. Hard bag. I have a Glenn Morangi here. So. Whoa, very nice. Cheers to that. Cheers so to that. Um, I am dressed in my uh, Hawaiian shirt so that we can talk about the Pacific. But before we get to that, we are going to have a quick appearance before our, our guest historian, Don Farrow. We're going to bring on the boss. Uh -huh. It's not Bruce Springsteen. I'm sorry. But it's the boss of Stephen Ambrose Historical Hail Board. Chief. What? Hail to the Chief. Yes, uh, I should be able to play that. We have Yakir Casper with us. Yakir, uh, how you doing? Very well, thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Um, and, I got a beer today. That's, that's uh, well. oh, Abbe Leff is a great, uh, great Belgian. I beer. know it's uh, Chris recommended to me a long time ago somewhere, so I still get a good beer in a pinch. I, I know that um, one day we will do the uh, wall and beer. Hopefully, I, yes. Roll of beer in history is a no, great no, wall, yeah, yeah, wall and beer. beer. Yeah. Also, um, coffee is it another okay. great topic. So but I, I wanna. I, I, I'm not an oracle. Okay, Chris. Well, uh, let I'm me sorry, ask you a question. Yeah, though. Yeah, the yeah, reason, yeah. the reason we brought you here on is to, uh, is we we fight to talk, is to. Um, uh, we've gotten some questions from folks uh, who are watching about uh, what's gonna, what's the prospect is for tours restarting at some point. They will restart at some point. Exactly what that point is, I'm not sure. Uh, even Yakir knows, but we asked him to come on and and tell us what you do know, what you can say. Well, I will try to minimize my lies or my incorrectness. <laughs> um, I and I'm not an oracle, but we have. Um, a lot of restriction at the moment. So I'll mention that European will not let, let American in group travel to come. Uh, Northern Mariana will not allow us to come right now. Japan is not allowed for American to fly in. So we can't really travel now. Those restrictions hopefully will lift in the next few months, everywhere. So, um, uh, oh. oops, wrong button there. So you're thinking that um, that possibly there might will are we are we is there anything possible to happen this year or do you, is it all at this point looking to to next year well one thing that we are still planning this year and we hope it will happen is Iwo Jima we hope that we can run the Iwo Jima that was supposed to run in February I March I'm sorry we hope to run it in October if the Japanese government allowing us to come on Iwo Jima and travel with restriction lift then we will travel in october not guarantee and uh, and we have a, a contingency um 
plan to run in March what we cannot run in October. So it will be a year late, not just seven months late. Um, the other thing is domestic. Maybe we feel like domestic travel will be more invi uh, inviting for our customers, like going on a, a Civil War tour or Revolutionary War tour or Lewis and Clark tour. In general, domestic tours can be more inviting. People who are a little older don't want to get sick outside of the country, but okay to be in the U.S. can choose to travel in locally. And Other than that, it's a uh, uh, group travel. Tra individual travel may open early, and people will see people traveling. They may travel themselves individually, but we have to remember that group travel will come after individual travel. We yeah, are sitting in one bus for two weeks, 30 of us. We want to feel safe. We don't want to lose people on the way, and we don't. So we, we it will take a little longer for group travel to open than uh, individual travel. Well, you can, you can confirm this, but I, I think, you know, what I've been getting here in London is that um, we want to travel and we want to be <laughs> all, <laughs> we but, want to travel. But it's a question of these governments have to open up these places for us. So right. even now, yeah. if you, if a plane load of Americans lands in London, um, you're stuck at Heathrow Airport in a hotel for two weeks. Yeah, I cannot go see my mother. I no, fly, I fly to Israel. I, I can't I have go to for two weeks in our ten. You know. So, so but I mean, I, I think you know what Rick and I would like to hear, and I'm sure our guests guests would like to hear is we're kind of committed to you know getting back on the road as soon as these restrictions get lifted up, right? Well, uh, I keep staff in the office. We keep um, at least three of us always on the phone. And answering email prepare, and preparing to open the day it's open. We will be landing. We will be, how do you say, uh, uh, landing uh, running. Yeah. Hit the ground yeah. running. Hit so, the hit the ground running. We're ready. I mean, we have staff in the office every day answering the phone and doing emails. So, so if we were summing up, open. if we were summing up, we might say there's there's a possibility, a uh, hope of Iwo, uh, Jima this fall possibly yeah. uh, some domestic this fall and really um, um, no reason to believe at this point that we can't restart the full slate of tours uh, next year. Right, exactly. It's depending actually, on, yes. Depending if on people, the future, because we're not profits. Right, if people want more certainty, they can just move what they have for this, this year to next year. And then we'll get more certainty. Well, yeah, Yakir, you thank you. Thank you so much for joining us and for answering that question. And I'm sure that uh, folks appreciate kind of getting the word and they can, of course, check the website, check the sure Facebook for, yeah. page and, and call. So thank you so much, Yakir, and, and uh, enjoy the show. Thank you. I agree. Right. I can't <laughs> wait for Don. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Well, we, we can't wait for Don either. So uh, uh, we should probably bring on, we can say hello to a few more people though. Uh, John Conway, Ross Wilson, Gene Templin, uh, Sean Lockheed, Derek Reynolds, Audrey Martins. We have a whole crew of folks here. Scott Hansen. Michael, uh, I'm not going to pronounce your last name, Michael. So Barb, I'm not going to pronounce Barb's last name. So Skarzynski. Okay, I pronounced it. Fine. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so, um, but we are, I am, did you notice I'm dressed I in did, I did, yeah. Hawaiian shirt? And that is for our topic today. Do you want to introduce our topic I and our love to. esteemed guest? Our esteemed guest this week is Don Farrell. Uh, Don is um, the Dean of Historians in the Northern Marianas. Uh, he's written uh, everything there is to write about uh, what's happened in the North Marianas. Um, he was the person that kind of started showing me around the islands. Um, Don f forgets more each day about what happened on those islands than most of us will learn in a lifetime. Um, I'm not sure that was a compliment, Don. It was. No, I was saying he just knows so much. Um, <laughs> but most importantly, he's been a really good friend uh, and a mentor to me. Um, and he just knows so, so much. Um, and we're really thrilled to get him out of bed or keep him from going to bed. Because um, it's quite, the timing is a little bit tricky uh, out in Saipan. So we are truly spanning the globe this week with history. It is 6.09 a.m. where you are, correct, Don? That's correct. The sun is coming out. It's going to be a, 
a beautiful, beautiful summer day. I, I want to just add to Chris's fantastic introduction by saying that earlier uh, this week, I emailed Don asking him for his bio, and I'm going to read you what he wrote me, uh, changing <laughs> one word ever so slightly. You. I was born on July 28th, 1947 in Redmond, Oregon, to an Army engineering outfit working in the Pacific. I remember the day well. When the doctor pulled me out with a pair of forceps, I yelled at that blank for an hour. So, <laughs> yeah. well, I remember Parker. not to write those things to you to give. You never say, people write me things and say, of course, you won't want to include this, but, and that is a guarantee. Exactly what is a guarantee. So, Chris, do you want to start off the questioning? Yeah, sure. I think interrogation um, of Don Farrell. Well, no, one of the things that um, Don and I often talk about uh, when we're together on our trips uh, is that the world tends to focus on uh, the landings in Normandy. And we just went through that again um, yesterday. If you look at your phone and Facebook messages, it's D-Day, D-Day, D-Day. And one of the things people uh, tend to forget is there's another invasion happening at about the same time. It's comparable in size for American involvement to the uh, the landings in Normandy uh, is critically important. Uh, and those are the landings of the Northern Marianas. And I, I, I look at the landings in Normandy and the Northern Marianas in that month of June 44, kind of like I look at uh, Gettysburg and Vicksburg during the American Civil War. Those are the two kind of engagements that one month that, that really, that's what kind of flips the switch and that's where the road to victory really begins. So uh, I thought it would be great to have Don talk about uh, the other big invasion in June 44 and why we should know some more about it. Well, thank you, Chris. I appreciate that. Yeah, here in the past, before we had internet, um, we, we would all watch, of course, uh, the cable stations. And on June 6th, every year, all day long, we had stories of the invasions of D-Day and the war in Europe and everything that was going on there, and not a single word about what was going on in the Pacific. Hmm. So I, living out here, I kind of made a promise to myself that I was going to do something about that. And so over the years, I've worked very hard at studying uh, the military history of Guam, Saipan, and Tinian. And um, and the culmination of that was understanding, trying to gain an understanding of exactly what it took to try to conduct two such huge operations at the same time in two different oceans. And that's the story of Operation Forager, the battle for the Marianas. So and it, was initiated, it was initiated on June 6th, essentially, Although uh, ships were gathering all the way from, uh, actually, from uh, Guadalcanal. The, uh, uh, the groups from the Southwest Pacific had to join the fleet that was also leaving simultaneously from Inuitok in the Marshall Islands, as well as Pearl Harbor in the Hawaiian Islands. So, Don, just, you know, since a lot of people don't know this, in terms of size, what are we talking about is the size of the U.S. fleet that's heading towards Saipan. Once they all came together, there was a total of 800 ships. Wow. Involved. Now, some coming from the Southwest Pacific, some coming from Inuitok, and some coming from Pearl Harbor, as I mentioned, but they all had to come together before they reached the Mariana Islands and arrive as one group on three different islands for three different invasions. It was a very, very complex. And as you know, especially you, Chris, uh, President Roosevelt had agreed with uh, Prime Minister Churchill that they would um, take a Germany first attitude towards fighting uh, the world war. At the time that Admiral King started pushing for a Central Pacific drive, a second front in the Pacific with General MacArthur advancing from Australia up through uh, the New Guinea area, headed towards the Philippines and then Japan. Uh, the Brits opposed that quite vehemently, 
on the grounds that it would be taking uh, effort away from the primary job of defeating Germany. So it took him uh, two full years of campaigning with the American Joint Chiefs of Staff and the combined British-American combined Chiefs of Staff uh, to get to convince them to uh, to open a second front in the Pacific and conduct these two invasions simultaneously. Don, Don one of the things that's that's interesting. You talked about the size of the invasion fleet, and I think you have three divisions of troops uh, landing, two Marine and one Army on Saipan, same number of divisions that land on, on D-Day the first day. One of the things that I think is interesting is the scale of the physical space. And I'm going to put up, you can talk about that, but I'm going to put up this image, and I don't know if you can see it, but it, it superimposes oh, yeah. the map of the U.S. over the South uh, Pacific and up where Maine is in the U.S. That we have that as uh, being where the Hawaiian Islands are, and Saipan is over where uh, someplace in Washington State or Northern California. Uh, Tokyo is up in British Columbia someplace. Chris is upset because London's not here not at even all. On the map. <laughs> and and I mean you know the the D Day was this incredible endeavor, but they're going you know, somewhere between 20 and 100 miles, depending on how far people are going. This is on a whole different scale. Yeah. No, that's very well done. Did you create that yourself? I stole it from the internet, Don. That's what I do. <laughs> you did not. I totally did. Are you serious? Absolutely. <laughs> no, that's, that's an excellent comparison. Yeah. The logistics were the big problem. Um, in every area you can imagine. Uh, Admiral King did keep his commitment to uh, the President's Atlantic Charter uh, in that he assured that there would be more than sufficient ships from the American side to participate in the Allied invasion of Normandy. He did that first. So he, he knew that he would have had to have fulfilled that pledge before he could ever even ask for the idea of completing this second one. So he had ended up gathering troops and ships from all over the Pacific, with the longest distance being about 3,500 miles wow. from Pearl Harbor to Saipan. And actually, Rick, there were three Marine divisions and two Army divisions involved in Operation Forager. The third Marine Division was also involved in the invasion of uh, Guam along with the 77th Army Infantry Division and the 1st Provisional Marine Brigade. Well, and there's then in no, Korea, yeah. they had the second and fourth. There's no question that of the three people here on the, uh, on the video feed that I'm number three in my knowledge of <laughs> the battle at Saipan. So I do win the gold, the, win the bronze medal, but I'll give you the gold and the silver. Thank you. So the other thing, you know, when John is talking about this, I think it's important for people to remember. Um, if you've been to the map room at Suffolk House, when we talk about D-Day and we talk about the logistical difficulties of having all the ships come together uh, south of the Isle of Wight at that place called Piccadilly Circus before they launch the invasion. So they have to time all the landing ships arriving at this one spot in the English Channel at the same moment to then go out and attack. Well, we're doing this in, in this operation but the ships are traveling 3,000 plus miles and they have to bring everything with them. There's no channel. There's no England that they can go back to and get more supplies and say, oh, I forgot the, I forgot the bullets. I'll be right back. They've got to bring it all with them, everything. Yeah, so the supply train was huge. Just pulling these giant concrete barges full of fuel oil for the ships is that they created gigantic concrete barges that they filled with fuel oil and drug along with the fleet to be able to refuel the fleet along the way uh, and timing it because they had to have more than one. And as Chris said, they get out here to fight the battle. And if somebody forgot the toilet paper, that's trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. So it was a logistical nightmare for, for everyone involved. And keeping in mind that this was all done at a time long before computers and laptops and cell phones. This was all done pencil and paper. Yeah. 
and and we have a, a a number of questions that have been put forward. I don't know if we can get to all of them, but this one fits into what we're talking about now. Was there pressure to delay Saipan until after the Normandy landings? And obviously, it it took place a week after, which is essentially the exact same time. Was there anybody saying, no, no, you really should wait until July or August or fall? In the beginning, there was right by but. With the advent of the B-29 and the ability to use the B-29, which, by the way, was supposed to go to England, right? But in 1943, there weren't enough planes around. And so um, General Aker, in, in acting out of London, decided to never mind and go with B-24s and B-17s. But the advent of the availability of B-29s, caused the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Combined Chiefs of Staff to agree to move forward with the invasion of the Marianas at that time, despite uh, some, some news from England that they didn't really want it to happen until later on. So well, remember, remember ahead, too, the, one of the, the other byproducts of this, of course, is that the, the whole Southern France landing is thrown out the window until much later that summer because there aren't enough ships. Yes. And, and part of the reason for that is you're launching the two of the biggest of our, our landings, yes. amphibious operations in history in the same month. But there were, there were so many Americans clamoring to get a punch back at Japan because of Pearl Harbor, especially the West Coasters. Uh, and, and there was a lot of pressure on the president to come in with some, something that would um, help both China and Russia on their end because we had delayed so long for this creating the second front in Europe, right? To take the pressure off the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. So uh, all things considered, it worked out and it worked out well. Uh, can we talk a little bit about the, um, uh, the, the battle of Saipan? I mean, I think that people are uh, familiar with Iwo Jima, they're familiar with Okinawa. I would say, I'm not necessarily talking about the people watching, but that most people barely even know there was a battle of Saipan and don't really understand that it was, you know, up until its time, I guess, the, the bloodiest battle in the Pacific. Can we talk a, talk a little bit about what goes on there? Certainly. Um, the Marine Corps was not designed as a land army. It was designed for shock landings, amphibious landings, capturing islands in the Pacific that could be turned into forward air bases that would then be able to support the movement to another island closer to Japan uh, and closer, closer to our, our ultimate target. The Battle of Saipan, however, Saipan is a, quite a large island compared to what they had done before at uh, Tarawa and in a we talk, uh, Majuro, you know, in the Marshall Islands. Uh, Saipan is a high island. It's mountainous in the middle. Um, it's a, a very, it's totally constructed out of coral. The whole thing is a giant, millions, millions year old pile of coral. So it's filled with caves and crevices. Great for defenders, horrible for attackers. So it was a very, very large island. The Japanese had been there since uh, 1914 and had done an excellent job of, um, for, of, of fortifying the island, far better than we knew. The, the American intelligence had pegged Japanese defenders at 15,000, that's one five thousand, uh, whereas there were a total of nearly 32,000 troops on the island. And uh, because Saipan was the first battle of the three, Saipan, Tinian, and Guam, uh, it upset the entire schedule for the whole, the whole event. And uh, the Japanese were well dug in. They knew very well that we had the B-29. As a matter of fact, on our invasion day, June 15, 1944, B-29s that had flown all the way to India, crossed the hump into China, made an attack on the uh, uh, Imperial Iron and Steel Works at Iwata on the same morning as our troops landed on Saipan. In essence, General Arnold, commander of the 20th Air Force and all B-29 operations, made a point to Japan saying, we are going to capture the Marianas. 
we are going to put the B-29s on your doorstep and they will be bringing you a load of bombs daily. Yeah. So it was a hugely significant, very difficult battle. It lasted twice as long as expected because they had twice as many defenders as expected. And as you mentioned, it was a horrible and bloody battle. Oh, oh there's some of our friends at one of the tanks up at the uh, Isley Airfield on Saipan. So just um, to, again, to kind of give you an idea of the intensity of what we're talking about here, um, the largest tank battle of the war in the Pacific. And uh, that tank you saw in the picture is yes. probably one of the survivors. So yeah. shortly, D plus one, I think, Don, it's 44 tanks. <laughs> That's uh, it. Try to take take the Marines out. The other thing is at the end of the battle, um, uh, the largest bonsai attack of the war. Um, again, de depending on the account you read, they think somewhere 3,000 to 4,000 Japanese come streaming down um, down the island to try to uh, eliminate the Americans. Uh, and to give you an idea of just how intense that is, um, one battalion of the 105th Infantry Regiment, so in, uh, it had been a New York National Guard unit, um, they earned three medals of honor on that evening. Trying yeah. to stop that bonds that was, uh, it was a predictable event. General Holland Smith, commander of all Marines, had warned everybody two days before yeah. to pay attention that the Japanese, once they know they've lost, have a tendency to conduct this final bonsai charge, take seven Americans for one Japanese life, and try to bleed us to death. Their entire game plan from day one had been based on the concept that America doesn't like long wars, that they had uh, given up on World War I early and signed an armistice with uh, Germany in, in November 1918. And they expected fully well that the Americans would do the same thing as long as they killed and wounded enough Americans to cause the American public to say, do we really need to go fight those? Do we need to fight all the way to Tokyo? Can we make a deal and get out of this and bring our boys home? And of course, they had irritated, to use a polite term, the American public so badly with the uh, Sunday morning attack on our, our, our fleet at Pearl Harbor that the Americans had nothing to do with that. They were fully convinced that, first of all, President Roosevelt, followed by President Truman, were absolutely correct that the Japanese military machine had to be annihilated. And unfortunately, because the Japanese would not surrender, and they had many opportunities to say, we know this isn't going to work, boys. We ought, to, we ought to get the best deal we can and get out of this. They fought on and caused the death of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands more Japanese, not only military, but Japanese civilians who suffered through the strategic air bombardment of Japan from the Mariana Islands. There's so many. If you, if you gentlemen don't mind, may I join your happy hour? Absolutely, you're supposed to. That's required. Thank you, sir. But, see, I knew I was waiting, Don. I saw that coffee cup. I was like, "What's going on?" Well, well, I, saved, I saved it for you, Chris. It's <laughs> 30 a.m. there, Chris. I mean, you know, he has standards. The sun has to be come up over the yard arm. You have to go down over the yard arm. The sun is up. <laughs> so. Um, there's so many places we could go uh, and so many questions that I have and some that are being posed by our audience, but I want to ask one other general question first before we dive into that, which is, um, this is, uh, we've talked a little bit about the land battle, which was uh, uh, as pretty large and gruesome and the largest tank battle in the Pacific. There's also a huge naval battle that takes place because of the invasion of the Northern Marianas and uh, uh, the Battle of the uh, Philippine Sea, I guess, uh, is one way to call it, or the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot is uh, uh, the nickname it's that oh, history God. has given it. Can you tell us a little bit about that and the importance of it? Well, you, you're right. When, when the Joint Chiefs of Staff were debating whether or not to proceed with this invasion of the Marianas, one of the points that Admiral Ernest King uh, commander-in-chief of uh, the United States fleet put forward was that this would most likely draw the Japanese Navy out for a fight. They had been trying to get the Japanese Imperial Navy to come out and face them, but 
there just wasn't enough bait. The, the Na their Navy had been, been very badly damaged, of course, at the Battle of Midway, and they had lost some more effective fleet along the way. Um, so they were tucked away in uh, a huge bay in the southern Philippines called Tawi Tawi. But as, uh, as they suspected, as Admiral King felt they would, as soon as they found out that the Americans were, gonna, uh, were trying to take the Mariana Islands, the fleet came out to face them. It became quite a controversial battle. It is well known as the Mariana's Turkey Shoot because Admiral Mitzner's uh, flyboys just destroyed the, uh, the, the uh, uh, air power from the uh, combined Imperial Naval Fleet that came out to fight and sent them home running with their tail between their legs. Admiral Spruance, who was commander in chief of the Fifth Fleet at that time, had made up his mind that his orders were to invade, capture, protect, and defend the Mariana Islands. His orders did not require him to, uh, to face the Japanese fleet in, a, in an ultimate battle. And this had gone way back to 1890 or whenever it was that Mahan. Uh, published his treaties on the value of battleships and strong navies and that the, the Navy would win the war and an ultimate fight. And of course, we saw it happen uh, in the Russo-Japanese War when the Japanese absolutely destroyed the Russian fleet and the war was essentially over at that point. The Japanese expected the same thing to happen. They had prepared for it. They were pleased to see the Americans coming deep within their own waters, where they had land-based aircraft uh, bombers that could, uh, once Mitchell proved his point, and then we reproved it at the, at the Battle of Midway, that, uh, that aircraft could, uh, could sink ships. So um, in, in the Battle of the Philippine Sea, Spruance did not go out to face the Japanese battle fleet. He stood about 125 miles off the east coast of the Marianas and waited for Admiral Ozawa's fleet to arrive. Admiral Ozawa's fleet, his aircraft had longer range than the aircraft uh, on our ships. So he had first strike opportunity and he did, but they failed to find our fleet adequately with that first strike. And as they did, we discovered where they were and Mitchell uh, launched his aircraft and then won what was the very first fleet to fleet battle where neither fleet saw a ship from the other fleet. It was an air battle only. Uh, so the carriers and the fleet escaped unharmed, except when it was over and Spruance knew that the, the fleet was running for home, he authorized Mitchell at that point to give chase. And so they went after the fleet, caught up to them, sank a couple of their aircraft carriers, a bunch of oilers. So by the time the Japanese Imperial Navy returned to Tokyo, um, they had nothing left. They had no air arm left. It was a ghost fleet. And there it was set for the rest of the war. Ghost. So the Battle of the Philippine Sea was strategic. And now, the, now God bless Spruance for making a wise decision. Mitchell just absolutely chewed him up one side and down the other. But uh, he made the right decision. Admiral King congratulated him before congratulating anybody else when he arrived on Saipan when the, when the battle was uh, over, declared secured on July 9th. And he stepped forward right in front of everybody else and shook hands first with Admiral Spruance. Spruance then uh, could conduct the rest of his battle in the Philippines knowing that he was secure, his Navy was secure, and that they would be able to conduct the rest of the, uh, the operation successfully without interference. And uh, of course, they had already eliminated all of the Japanese aircraft on Saipan, Tinian, and Guam. Uh, and now the Japanese defenders on Saipan after June 20. Uh, knew that their their cavalry was not coming over the horizon. 
And the same thing would be true then for the Japanese ensconced at Tinian and Guam. Uh, they fought viciously to the very end of the Battle for Guam, which wasn't concluded until August 10th, June 12th, June, where June 12th began the aerial combat in Saipan. The battle for the Marianas was not considered secure until August 10th. So three full months of combat. And a lot of a lot of dead Marines, a lot of dead soldiers. So, you know, Don, I, one of the things I, I wanted to kind of bring up, because I know we've been getting a lot of questions sort of about this topic. Um, you try to wrap them into one, but um, one of the features of the fighting is um, it's kind of the intensity of it um, and, and the animosity between the two sides. Um, it, it's, it's vicious. Um, I've always thought that one of the reasons – um, for that was that the Japanese defending Saipan knew that this was, we're getting very close to home now. Um, you know, the, there's Japanese civilians on Saipan. Uh, it's in their defensive perimeter there. Um, so that's that's going to create a, a kind of a, an intensity to the combat that we hadn't experienced before. But there's a lot of Japanese civilians on the island, and, and um, we've been getting some questions about it, but they get involved in the, in the combat, and it kind of a tragic way and it doesn't end well for them. Um, and I was wondering if you could kind of elaborate on what happens to what the Japanese civilians are doing there and, and, and what happens to them as they get caught up in this. Well, you, you're absolutely right, Chris. There were, there were about 30,000 uh, Japanese uh, civilians on Saipan and another 15,000 on Tinian. And they were, they were trapped between these two huge military forces that were coming together to try to capture this very strategic territory. And they were loyal Japanese citizens, Japanese from the home islands, particularly, right? And, and the Japanese troops from the home islands that were there to defend them uh, were, well, it would be like us if the Japanese had actually invaded Hawaii. You don't think that some of our boys in, were in civilian uniforms wouldn't have grabbed a rifle and, and helped out? Well, the Japanese civilians did the same thing on Saipan. Uh, there were also Japanese from Okinawa and the other island uh, territories of Japan, as well as Japanese Koreans who had become citizens of Japan after 1910 when Japan... Um, um, amalgamated Korea into their sphere, their, their country. The, Korea was actually a part of Japan at the time of this battle. Now, the Koreans on Saipan and Tinian had absolutely no love for the Japanese. And so they did not join the fight in the least, and they certainly didn't commit suicide at the end of the war. They went to the caves and they, uh, they spent their time, um, you know, just trying to stay alive, trying to survive this thing knowing that when the Americans won the battle, that they would be repatriated as citizens of a, of a nation that was to be liberated by the war. The Japanese on Okinawa, the Japanese from the home islands, on the other hand, were um, dedicated Japanese, and they did their best to try to, to help stay out of the way or help the, the battlefront uh, until the very end. And many of them participated in, uh, in battle activities, although they didn't really contribute very much. But at the end, uh, like you said, Chris, uh, a large number, some, some say 3,000, uh, actually rather than surrender, when the Marines said force them with their back against the cliff uh, to either to surrender, their suicide cliff, thank you, uh, they, the Japanese civilians had been forced to the end of the island. This is the very northern end of, of Saipan. And the civilians were in caves and hideouts up there on the top trying to duck uh, American air power and, and shell fire from offshore. Uh, and about, about 3,000 of them jumped off of that cliff mm. rather than surrender. And then the same thing happened again in the Battle for Tinian. <coughs> Excuse me. And there are, if you, for those of you who come to Saipan and, and join us on one of the, one of the tours, 
This is one of the many, many monuments constructed at Banzai Cliff, another place where the Japanese jump, um, memorializing the Japanese who remained loyal to Japan and refused to surrender and jumped. Well, you know, and I, one of the things that I found really interesting about that is, of course, when you read the descriptions, and there's film footage of, of this, of course, the Marines that are seeing this are just horrified. And, and the descriptions, when you read them, even now, are just their stomach turning. But I, I tell you, Chris, this, the saddest pictures you see, or maybe not the saddest, the, the one that raises your thought the most is seeing pictures of these Marines who had been in battle since uh, June 15th, and now it's August 7, 8, 9, and the, these men who had been killing Japanese day after day, night after night after night, find a cave full of, of Japanese civilians and, and are begging them to come out and surrender. And then you got pictures of them carrying uh, a Japanese child who had been the only survivor of his family, perhaps, uh, bringing him back to safety and giving him food and water. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's tragic. Those who ended up in the civilian stockades on Saipan and on Tinian uh, were amazed to find out that these cold-blooded, murderous Marines were actually good guys and, and uh, that the Americans helped them, gave them food, gave them medical attention, took the best care of them they could for two years until they were all repatriated and sent back home. Yeah, well, I think you know, one of the points I, I found interesting was that, you know, the American, uh, they're writing about this event. So people are, are aware of what's happening. The, the Japanese actually get some of these news reports of what the civilians are doing on Saipan. And Japanese in Japan, because now they're getting ready for what they assume is going to be the invasion of the home islands, are saying, look at the glorious sacrifice of the civilians on Saipan, and this is what you should be prepared to do when the Americans come to the home islands. So the Japanese are actually using this as a, as a propaganda tool to get their own people kind of even more ramped up. For right. reading, reading the propaganda reports, uh, and especially the post-war interviews of these same people saying, okay, what do you think about it now? Uh, they were faced with a huge dilemma. They had been raised since the time they were the littlest children to adore, adore the emperor and to respect the military front. And they simply could not bring themselves to say, even to themselves, we made a mistake, yep. that this was unnecessary that all of our children who had died in this war were a useless sacrifice. And that uh, must have been, I mean, how do you sit around with your neighbors who survived and you're trying to rebuild your city and rebuild your country and know that your brother's fathers, you know, had been forced, not forced, had willingly, gone to, to battle thinking they were doing something great for their nation only to find out that the military clique that, Rui, that ruled the islands at that time had sacrificed their lives needlessly. Yeah. I, I mean, that, that's got to be a horrible memory. And, but it did do exactly what President Roosevelt and President Truman wanted. Uh, the, the military was gone. And as a matter of fact, when they wrote their new constitution at the direction of General MacArthur, right, it included a clause that said there shall be no military uh, in, in Japan. And that was exactly what, what they wanted to happen. And that's what did happen. And that's why we have spent now, how many, 75 years uh, in, a, in a very solid alliance with Japan. And it is the cornerstone to peace in the Pacific. You know, um, I wanted to 
to to shift the topic slightly based on one of our questions um uh, the the invasion of saipan is led by um, uh, a great marine general holland smith the army division on saipan is led by a general named ralph a great general named ralph smith so we have and we have uh, what comes up in the course of this invasion is a Smith versus Smith controversy that I believe pits you two against each other. I you can just, on purpose, right? I, I can just drop myself out <laughs> and let you go. <laughs> Smith versus Smith, yes. Uh, the best book on that, by the way, is by Harry Gailey, G-A-I-L-E-Y, Harry Gailey. And it's called Smith versus Smith. Uh, now, he was an Army guy, and so he wrote it from an Army perspective. Well, he was fighting the Marine Corps propaganda machine. My God. <laughs> but uh, Holland Smith was, you know, came from a, a completely different background than Ralph Smith. And, and uh, he, he was had a Marine's attitude. The Marine's attitude is, yes, we'll lose a couple of more extra guys in a frontal assault without all of the artillery and everything behind us, but we'll get the job done faster and therefore save more lives in the long run. You mean like they did a tarot? Yes. Yeah. And so, right. Okay. Just wanted to do that. And so... Uh, when Smith didn't move fast I'm enough. get hurt between you two guys here. I'm a little concerned about it. <laughs> so when they got to Death Valley, which was quite appropriately named on the backside of Mount Tapachow, um, uh, and, and Ralph Smith would not push his men into that valley of death uh, and left Marines on his left and his right stranded behind the lines. Uh, uh, Smith, Holland Smith just blew his cork and said, "You're fired." <laughs> he did. He did advise Spruance of what he was going to do, although he didn't really have to. Uh, and Smith sort of said, "Well, do what you got to do." Uh, the guy and the guy that followed him was uh, Major General uh, Sandiford Jarman, who then took command of the 27th, finished the uh, the battle. There were no great battles after that. And uh, he became uh, Saipan Island commander and uh, was most famous for building the largest island command house, view lot house in the Pacific. I thought that was your house, Don. Is it safe to come back? <laughs> well, this is for the next fight. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, no, that, uh, that's an interesting interlude. It always comes up in every conversation. And um, I thought Harry Gailey put up a good argument that these guys uh, were not trained to go into the jungle as the Marines were. They were new, they had not faced uh, combat before on the island. And so they were, fr they were fresh, they had the energy uh, and they had full strength. Uh, so pulling back the Marines a little bit and pushing the, uh, the army into that, was the appropriate thing to do. It just, it was more than, than that particular army unit. As Chris said, they were a National Guard unit, right? They were not ready for jungle warfare. Well, I, you know, I think without getting into the weeds of doctrine, maybe that's another show, but the Marines and the army have, they just evolve separately. They have two different ways of yep. looking at the war. And, you know, Saipan was, a different operation than what the Marines had done before. I mean, Tarawa is at what, two miles by a mile? I mean, it's, it's tiny. These islands that the Marines had fought in before were very small. Um, you can be very direct. There's not a lot of room to maneuver and shake things out. And they're commanding smaller forces. And when Smith is commanding three divisions, no Marine had ever commanded anything that large before. Yes. Well, Yep. And the army is saying, well, we've trained generals to command divisions and corps and armies. And it's not the same thing as commanding 12 landing craft hitting a beach. It's a different kind of thing. Yep. Uh, so there's that problem. Then the other problem is, is as the, as the plan is being developed, which is all kind of done on the fly, um, 
Smith has given clear instructions to the second and fourth division about what they're supposed to do, what they're going to, what the landing plan is going to be. And then he kind of looks over his shoulder to the 27th division and goes, Oh, you just guys, you just follow along behind us. So the army staff is having to constantly develop plans and they don't even know exactly what they're going to be doing when they get there. They were not intended to be part of the landing at all. Right. They were never supposed to leave their ship. So all of a sudden, when the land, when when the combat gets very intense on the island, they're just kind of thrown in. They haven't been briefed. They haven't. They don't have a plan. Yep. They're just kind of thrown in piecemeal. And and well, it's, what had happened was when Oz, when when Spruance found out that Ozawa was coming out to fight, he was forced to make the critical decision on what to do about the rest of Operation Forager. Tinian and Guam had not been approached yet. I mean, they were under naval bombardment, but there was no landing scheduled there. And the battle for Saipan was only supposed to take 10 days. Two divi- They felt that two divisions, the second and fourth Marine Division, were more than enough to handle 15,000 Japanese. But now all of a sudden, on I believe June 17th, after two days of battle on Saipan, Spruance finds out Ozawa is coming out to fight. That means he's going to have to to get out of there and go out and defend the island against the approaching Japanese Navy. To do that, he felt two things were had to happen. One, he had to uh, commit the uh, the 27th Infantry Division to the fight because he knew by now they had more Japanese on the island than what was anticipated, twice as many more and that he needed to get enough supplies on the ground <clears throat> to be able to support the Marines who were already on the ground, plus the army that was going to be landing, while he went out to face Ozawa, not knowing how long that battle was going to take or what that battle was going to constitute. So the battle for Guam was postponed for five weeks so that they could bring another reserve division, another army division from Hawaii. That's the 77th Army Infantry Division. That took five weeks. During those five weeks, the most atrocious activities took place on Guam. That's where the great majority of all the killings and beheadings and, I mean, it was just horrible, took place. I I want to mention, we have a comment from from Jack about General Smith uh, uh, that he was the last living World War II general. We, you, you say that people say that uh, the last man standing is the one to win. General Ralph Smith, the Army general, lived to be one hundred and five years yeah. old, and I'll bet every day he was pissed at Holland Smith. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Just like, just like. Uh, Tibbets, Paul Tibbets, the guy that dropped the bomb, yeah. and his number two, Sweeney, who yeah. dropped the bomb on, on Nagasaki. Oh, my God, right. Truman, Tibbets fully expected he would become commander of a whole wing of, of nuclear B-29s. Well, he didn't get the job right? because he had irritated so many people along the way. Nobody wanted to deal with him anymore. So he quit. He dropped out. He he resigned from the Army Air Force as a brigadier general. Sweeney stayed in, retired as a major general, and every day he chuckled a little bit about being the survivor. <laughs> Same story. So, Don, I'm going to drop a question in here. Since you are the chief spokesman for the Marine Corps fan club here. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. All right, here you go. Booyah. There we go. There's a question for you. What is the one thing about the Marians fighting in Saipan that most of us would not know about? They needed the army to help them. <laughs> I'm glad I wasn't taking a step when you said that. <laughs> I'm certain that that was one of them. You just sent the Glenn Morangi <laughs> down the wrong way. You can't do that, Chris. Morning, please. Sorry. Oh, what is the one thing about the Marines landing on Saipan that we would not know about? Well, there were a whole bunch of things that were in the plan that didn't happen. A plan is a plan. That's all. 
right? And and every battle that takes place, Normandy, wherever, right? You, you have a plan. This is the way we're going to do it. And that's the way you go into the fight until the opponent takes a swing back. And then you react to that swing back. Well, uh, the battle for Saipan had, had many different facets to it that never happened. There was supposed to be a complete fake landing uh, on, on the back side of Saipan. With one Italian coming ashore. A fake landing? Yes. Is that like the ghost army? Someone asked us how we were going to get the ghost army into this, and I think we've just <laughs> done it. We have to drink whenever we mention the ghost army. So, All right. That battle never took place. The uh, the control, getting getting the Marines onto the right beach was a mess. 900 amphibious tractors were all launched towards the shore of shores of Saipan at the same time. Yeah, can Not you explain can you can you explain the the amp tracks because you know people probably think all invasions happened with Higgins boats and the Marines were big fans of Higgins boats but something well, this, different is used here. Yeah. The amphibious warfare along with everything else evolved from from day 1 of of the, of World War 2. And uh, one of the things that Holland Smith wanted was a vehicle that could cross a reef, right? With you know, right, the Higgins boat can't cross a reef. It comes to the reef, it drops its ramp, you get off. But the lagoon on the other side could be nine, ten feet deep, mm -hmm. right? What he wanted was a vehicle that could crawl across the reef, then motorize all the way to the shore, and not even just stop at the shore, but drive on inshore before letting the Marines out so that they didn't have to get out under a hail of, of bullets. The, the, the scene you see in all of the Normandy movies, right? The front end drops down and the machine guns are shooting in your face, right? So they created this amphibious tractor, a tracked vehicle. And it had guns, it had 50 calibers. Some of them had 20 millimeter guns on the front of them. Uh, and they carried about half a squad. And so the job was to get up over the reef and then, then actually swim through in within your vehicle all the way across the lagoon. And the lagoon is half a mile, almost a mile deep at some places until it gets to the actual landing beach. Uh, but the problem was with currents and all the gunfire and all the smoke, because the, the Navy, of course, had been conducting this pre-invasion bombardment on the beach right up until, oh, until the boats were within 100 yards of shore. Uh, giant 16, 18 inch gun shells were landing on the beach in front of them. So it was covered with smoke. They lost their way. And so on, on the northern end, right, the second Marine Division area, they got stretched out long ways. And it took them quite a while to get their units back together. Again. I've, I've seen some movies about Normandy with the uh, landing that took place in estranged beaches where they weren't supposed to be or behind the lines. And, and the, the paratroopers being dropped and had to, to collect their units back together again. That same thing happened during the Battle of Saipan while they were under fire right on the beach. And, and they lost a lot of extra men just trying to reorganize their units and getting them ready to move ashore. So that's not well published. All you hear is the good stuff, of course. Victor's right for war. <laughs> um. We are nearing the end of our, our hour, and we have not even really gotten to Tinian and the Bomb, which you've written a great book about. So we obviously are now under an obligation to bring you back, which we will. In you know, that's why I stretched this out so I could get two shows. We All can right. probably bring you back in August because that would be a good timing for that. Um, and, but I, I want to ask you a question, um, you know, what, what some of our viewers know and, and some don't is that you've lived in the Marianas Islands for 30 plus years. Um, you are one of the, uh, Chris, Chris described you as the Dean of Historians there. I think that has something to do with the beard. You're kind of like yeah, the, he was the KFC franchise. That's who's the I'm guy saying. from Harry Potter who has a beard like that? I mean, that is sort of a, Yes. Oh, and you know right away because that's what you do on oh, Halloween. I've been told that all the time. You, uh, yes, you you have a go-to Halloween costume party uh, uh, costume. So what I'm interested in is: Are there people still, or were there up to recently, people on 
Saipan or Tinian, which for those who don't know is 10 miles away from, from Saipan. Two. Oh, yeah. Well, parts of it are 10 miles away. <laughs> <laughs> Depending on where you stand. <laughs> you put up with this every day. Hey, I don't know if you can see Russia from there, but the point is, <laughs> are there people still alive or recently alive, civilians who were there at the time who remember this, or is it completely different people? Uh, today, it's mostly completely different people. When I first got here in, in uh, I arrived in Guam in January 77. So my first publications were about uh, the Battle of Guam. And at that time, almost every backyard barbecue I went to, uh, there was somebody in the family who distinctly and very clearly remembered the Japanese and the Marines fighting and what the Japanese had done to them during those five weeks. And it took me a long time to develop um, enough rapport with the local people to where they would sit down and tell some of these stories, especially the rape stories. I mean, it was, it was like pandemic on the island. The Japanese knew that they were going to die. So what the hell, right? Rape a few along the way. And, and it was terrible. And, and on Saipan, when I first got here, when uh, in the Northern Marianas in '87, there were still many people here who did remember uh, surviving the battle and were able to tell me their stories of how they how they survived, going into the caves, trying to find water, trying trying to to, to get their family through alive, and then their two years in the refugee stockade before they were allowed to go and, and begin rebuilding their homes. Today, <clears throat> not so much. Almost everybody's gone. There are very, very few who would remember with any clarity, uh, perhaps, um, being on Saipan or Tinian in the days right after the war. So not very much anymore. And, and Don, I'm sure there are people who want to know, since you're wearing a Vietnam veteran hat, and some people have commented on that. I'm a year of veteran. I never went in country. Okay. This was said to me by a very close friend who was a uh, two-time, two, he did two tours in Vietnam. And he had always asked me where was my Vietnam hat, uh, veteran's hat. And I said, I'm not going to wear one. I never went in country. That would be... An insult to those right, who did stolen valor. So he finally found this hat and mailed it to me. He said, you can wear this hat. And I said, I will wear this hat because I do remember the Vietnam era so well. It seems in some degree we're practically returning to 68. I think you've all read that. On the we, have, we have felt that. We have yeah. felt that. So, so uh, that's that's why I wear this hat. So Don, we uh, like as Rick said, we've um, kind of run out of time. So seriously though, you wouldn't mind coming back so we can continue talking about this and oh, absolutely. Uh, we we want to continue. If it had not been for the Battle of the Marianas, had the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the, and, and the Combined Chiefs of Staff said, no, no, no we're not going to open a second front in the Pacific. You're gonna go over and join MacArthur and from there, you and MacArthur, Nimitz, you and MacArthur are gonna go to Japan, all right? Never mind all of these Marines that are gonna to have to die in uh, in Saipan and then subsequently at Iwo and Okinawa. Never mind that. Uh, had they not done that, we would have not had the B-29 forces from the Marianas and therefore the atomic bomb could not have been flown to Japan directly from one of the islands. Oh, there's the Enola Gay. So they, we got it in. <laughs> so seriously, folks. Um, anyway, we'll, we'll come back to this in August. was key to the rest of the Pacific, as Admiral King well knew. It cut the line of communications uh, for the Japanese. They could no longer send troops to reinforce the South. They could no longer receive re uh, uh, reinforcements, supplies from the South to the North. Uh, and it, 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 did exactly what it was supposed to do, gave Nimitz and his CVs the opportunity to build air bases to take the war to Japan. And from here, it was a hop, skip, and a jump to Iwo Jima and then Okinawa and directly to Japan. It, it was truly a, a turning point 
in American uh, military history. Guys, it is um, without question the most important battle of World War II that most people have not read a thing about. So um, we've posted or we'll soon post a reading list of some recommended titles. Please check them out. Um, I'm going to put this up. You have to wait till Don's next appearance, but this is his book. <laughs> the only one in London. Well, hang, hang on, Chris. We're going to we're going to give you we're going to give you the full screen there. Yeah. There we go. Tinian and the Bomb: Project Alberta and Operation Centerboard by Don A. Farrell. Don, what's the A stand for? Alan. Alan. So, so I don't. Uh, I don't. No, like I don't like to sing Don's praises too much uh, because it swells his head. And but, then the hat doesn't fit. But the hat doesn't fit. But it's an amazing book. And when we get Don back, we'll talk some more about it. And Don's beard grows every time he tells the truth. So that's why it's so long. So Don, Don Farrell, thank you so much. We're looking at the comments. And clearly, people wish you were the host of the show instead of us. And that's a little upsetting. But we're there. We we will bring you back and uh, thank you so much for joining us. And I know it's 7.05 a.m. So go have a cup of coffee and enjoy a lovely morning on the island of Tinny and Don Farrell. Thank you, Rick. Historian. Thank, thank you for joining us. Thank, thank you, Chris. You All guys right. have a good day. Thank you. Can I tell my joke now? Yeah. So it's time for the, your history joke of the it week. Is, Don't you want a beard like that? I mean... Well, I was going to grow mutton chops, but how long would it take me to grow that beard? Well, you have time to check it out. And I know Don can still hear us, so it's okay. I'm I'm I all think, right with that. But I think so Yakir, Yakir should have all the historians grow Don beards. Yakir's still here, so if he's not eating, we can uh, ask him. What do you think, what? Yakir? You could hear me eating. Yeah. Uh, Why Don didn't you? No, I could see you eating. But I can see you, I, but no, but the audience can't see you. Oh, Don't worry about it. Goodness. But thank I did goodness. just rat you out. So I, I, I have the, the, the uh, what you call the roach. The, <laughs> the roach beer. Or the bitnik. Or the bitnik, you know. All right, I'm bringing yeah, Don so. back so he can defend himself. Because right. I'm, we're going to attack The only beer. reason I wear this is so people can recognize me when I go to a foreign airport. Oh. Wait, are, we off, are we off the air? No, just we're here. on the air, Yakir. We yeah, just, going to, the show just keeps going and going. Does anybody ever oh, have my a chicken? What? What, we need, what we need is a picture of Yakir on his motorcycle 20 years ago. Oh, oh uh, uh, well, <laughs> you don't want to scare that. Right. Well, we'll, we'll save that. Well, I will tell you a quick story about today's... Uh, uh, hello? Yes, yeah. we're, you're here. Okay, so... I can hear I, you. I have my leather jacket. In the audience uh, is like a little jacket, okay. and I'm going on a car in New York City uh, on a car on the subway about 11 o'clock at night. I'm very worried about who I'm going to see there. And then I notice that they are actually all leaving my car because they are worried of me. Well, <laughs> I'm <laughs> scared going, when, when I'm scared going on the car, I'm actually everybody is scared of me and living the country. <laughs> I'm I'm still scared of you, you care. So just for the record. Wow. Uh, and and all other former paratroopers. Okay, I'm just scared of them all. Okay. So you care, thank you for joining us earlier today. And uh Don, again, thank you for joining us. And you know, you never know when you might get brought back. Anytime, day or night, we can now bring your link in. So uh, <laughs> anytime. Be afraid. Be very afraid. It's Chris Anderson, give us a joke, a history joke, please. A history joke for this week. I was talking to uh, a veteran of the 27th Division. Yeah. He got really tired of uh, all these stories about the Marines in the Pacific, and he pointed out to me that uh, there were more Army troops deployed to the Pacific than Marines, which is an interesting factoid. Really? But, yes. But he told me this. He told me this story. He said, I was in many battles, Chris, and I'm Thankfully, I got through them all and I made it back home. But in all my many battles, you want to know what the most dangerous place to be uh, on a Pacific island was during the war? What was it? To get between a Marine and a camera. Oh, whoa. Guys, you're all. I thought it, I thought it was going to be to get between Douglas MacArthur and a camera. Yeah, nope, we get between a Marine and a camera. Now, you said you had two. Do you have a second one? I or do. This was the one I was going to tell last week. 
the, or did, or is that the good one? And now I'm I'm giving you an anticlimax. I mean, well, we have a smaller yeah. audience, so it's okay if you crash and burn. This is We're all joke. Just friends now. This is just another historical joke. So as you know, uh, the British forces deployed that deployed to France uh, in 1940. They were called the British Expeditionary Force, right? Uh, and the initials were BEF. Uh, and before Dunkirk, they had been up to Norway and that hadn't gone so well. So after Dunkirk, uh, amongst uh, the more humorous here in London, do you know what BEF stood for? I can't wait to find out. Back every Friday. <laughs> and that can work in the Greek islands and elsewhere. <laughs> It, it, it continues throughout. Um, everybody, thank you so much. The, the few of you who've decided to stay through to the jokes, thank you so much for joining us here on History Happy Hour. And next week, if I'm correct, I believe we have Eric Schnitzer uh, from the National Park Service talking about the Battle of Saratoga. Many of you may not even know about that World War II battle fought in upstate <laughs> New York between the colonials and the British. But uh, it's a fabulous battle, and Eric is very knowledgeable. And then the week after that, we're going to talk about Lawrence of Arabia. And we have shows planned throughout the summer. So we want you to join us. Thank you so much. We appreciate everybody putting your comments on and your questions on. And we're only sorry we couldn't get to all of them. But wasn't Don awesome? Let him let him know in your comments how awesome he was, because he was just a tremendous and awesome guest. And we, we don't try to end the show. Um, what do we do before we end the show, Chris? We say thank you, which you just did. Oh, okay. And then you hit the button for that that explosive ending. Oh, right, the big ending, and we we wouldn't want to lead up to it and then have it be an anticlimax. But here it is. <laughs>